Hey guys, this is Evan here at GDC 2013 in San Francisco. I'm still in the Tripwire booth. Uh, just had a chance to see Rising Storm. Check out our other video for more footage of that. And just continue our conversation with John Gibson, president of Tripwire Interactive. Hey, John. Hello, how's it going, Evan? Just fine. So uh, one of the thing that's, things that's interesting to me about Rising Storm is it's, it's a project that began as a mod, but that you've sort of adopted and collaborated with that modding team directly. And you're also going to be sharing profits with them. Um, yeah, can you sort of explain how that came about and, and, and why you went about it that way? Yeah, I, and I think this is something that, that people don't uh, talk about often enough with, with Rising Storm because they just look at the game and whether or not they're interested in it. But it's got a really interesting backstory. You know, really what we looked at uh, when we were working on Red Orchestra 2, we were looking at a lot of the total conversion mods that were coming out at the time. And, and we're seeing that they were all coming out two, three, even four years after a game had released oftentimes what I would say past the game's peak of popularity. And looking back, you know, at our mod roots, you know, starting with the Red Orchestra mod, our mod came out six months after Unreal Tournament 2003, right when it was in its peak, which I think really helped catapult us in popularity. So we, we started looking at ways that we could help mod teams get something out uh, much sooner than two or three years later after Red Orchestra 2 launched. And we came up with this idea of assembling what we'd called an all-star mod team. Find the best modders from the Red Orchestra mod uh, community and get them on one mod team making one super mod. And so that's what we did. We got them together and, and we gave them access to the SDK, the mod SDK, a year before the game ship, shipped, which is really uh, almost unheard of these days. Most of the time you don't even get a mod SDK. You know, some developers uh, are saying that, uh, you know, modders aren't smart enough to, to make mods for their games. And, and we think that's, that's just BS. Mods are, modders are really smart. So we gave them those tools and we, we made a deal with them. We said, uh, we're going to give you, we're going to give you some money if you finish this, regardless. So if you're going to work on this thing for a year or two or however long, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna give you something, some, some of a reward. Because really, modding is hard enough but modding a game that's still in development is incredibly hard because the, the content was constantly changing and it caused them a lot of headaches, especially in the early days. But we also said, if things, this thing's good, we'll make it a free mod, we'll release it over Steam like we did you know, back in the day with Darkest Hour or Mare Nostrum for Red Orchestra 1. Uh, but if it's really good, we'll, we'll pull it in-house uh, and collaborating with the mod team, help you polish it up to make a commercial product, and we'll give you a percentage of the royalties. So it was, it was really just this crazy experiment. And we, we had no idea, you know, two and a half years ago or whenever we started it, uh, whether or not it was going to work. But, you know, here we are at the end. We've got this amazing new game coming out, you know, started by modders. You know, all of the great ideas in the game or most of the great ideas came from the mod team. And we've just helped them polish it to perfection. So I'm glad you bring that up. I mean, it, it is something else we hear from some developers that, you know, building a game to be modable, modable is difficult. It takes time away from actual development. It takes time away from, you know, preparing for E3 and demos and things like that. So in, in the case of Rising Storm and the SDK that you guys prepared, did it take that long? Was it a big effort? It, it was honestly a massive effort. It, uh, you know, we had, at some point in times, we had our entire engineering team, our entire code team working on just supporting the SDK while we were still developing the game. There would be like a month and we were like, okay, this month we have to catch the SDK up so that the guys in Rising Storm can keep working. It was a lot of work. So, um, but I think that it's worth it. You know, when you look at, um, you know, the, one of the big strengths of the PC as a platform is, is modability. And we thought, you know, even if it weren't for Rising Storm, when the game came out, we wanted people to be able to make new content for it. And we have, even now, all these exciting mods in development. We've got In Country Vietnam, which is a really cool looking, you know, it looks like it's really cool. I've seen sneak preview versions of it running around the office uh, that, that people have. Uh, there's another mod uh, called Grabenkrieg, and it's a World War I mod. There's a group of modders uh, churning out vehicles you know, transports and new tanks, and it's all really neat stuff. And, and as a developer, it's so fun to me to be able to experience that content, you know, new maps, things that, you know, because when you're developing something, you get to see it when it's just this blocky Lego looking concept of a map, and you play, play it a thousand times before it's finished. But when mod content comes out, I get to experience it just like a fan, and it's, it's very exciting. 
Very neat. Uh, so when Red Orcs 2, 2 originally released, um, you know, you guys have talked openly about that you weren't completely happy with the condition it came out in, that you might have hurried things a little bit too much. Does Rising Storm represent sort of a, a second chance to you at all? Yeah, I think, I think Rising Storm represents maybe a third chance. <laughs> we, uh, you know, we've joked internally that the Game of the Year edition that we shipped uh, about a year ago, that's when the game really was finished. And, uh, you know, we really saw after we released the game and had problems and uh, we should have waited longer to ship it. And there was kind of a negative uh, buzz around the game. So we had to turn that around. And we really have seen that in the past probably six or eight months. Players are, have gotten, okay, yes, it had problems when it came out, but it's fixed and now it's really fun. So I think, I think that helped us um, kind of recover to a degree. But I think Rising Storm is kind of the, the really big chance to prove, okay, this is a whole new game. Uh, this is our chance to prove we're going to polish this thing till it's ready. We're going to make sure that it's awesome, running well, bug-free, as bug-free as you can get, and uh, before we let it out the door. And that's, that's part of the reason why we, we've been asked a lot, you know, what's the ship date? Well, we have a target, but um, we're not going to announce anything until we're really certain that we can hit that. So you're committed to taking your time with Rising Storm? Absolutely. Cool. So when I was uh, when I came down to visit Tripwire in Georgia uh, to play Rising Storm for our hands-on preview in PC Gamer, uh, you, you introduced me to Elliot Cannon, who's somebody you hired recently, a veteran FPS developer. Can you t talk to me about the influence he's had on the project? He's lead designer. Um, just what ideas has he brought to Rising Storm? I think with, with Elliot, what he did was he brought uh, an external perspective. You know, game developers sometimes, uh, they tend to get down in the trenches with their game and they're not peering over the top and seeing off in, you know, seeing it off in the distance, so to speak. And he, having been someone that, that hasn't been working on the Red Orchestra franchise for 10 years, or hasn't, like most of the Rising Storm team, just been a fan of the series for a very long time, he brought an external perspective. And he had kind of a different gameplay style, you know, just when we play the game than we do. A lot of the guys in the office tend to be long-range rifle sniper type people, and he's more of a in-your-face player. Get up close, attack with a submachine gun. So he really influenced a lot of the refinements on the maps to allow for uh, that type of play, that getting up close and personal type of play. I think he really, he really pushed the design team to, to modify the flow of the maps to support that really well. And he, he had some really great ideas working with, with, with me and the rest of the design team at Tripwire on refining the asymmetrical features of the game. Uh, the, the mod team had uh, some really good concepts, uh, but frankly, they were, they were pretty rough uh, initially. Some of, them, some of them were working well, and some of them just weren't, they just weren't gelling. So Elliot had a lot of input on, uh, on bringing those features to, uh, to be really polished and, and usable and functional in the game. Can you speak to just, just how, how Rising Storm feels differently from Red Orchestra 2? I mean, the setting's very different. You have some more, arguably more asymmetry in place. We've been talking about that. Um, but as a shooter player, what, what, am, what am I going to experience that's different than what I did in Red Orchestra 2? I think, I think part of it is, is just the environments, not just that the setting is different, but that the maps are constructed very different. In, in Red Orchestra 2, um, there are a lot of very, very open, um, long-range rifle maps with, uh, with, with some cover, but, but you really have to be super, super careful to move from place to place in Red Orchestra 2. And Rising Storm, especially because of the jungle environment, that jungle provides you concealment. So players can move up to a lot closer ranges to engage uh, than they would in Red Orchestra 2. So it means that you, you have uh, you know, a lot closer range engagements or, or the ability to have a lot closer range engagements than you often did in Red Orchestra 2, uh, especially if you're kind of a sneaky player. But, but also we wanted to retain, we wanted to still retain those long range firefights. So it's, it's more like we have, we have a, a better mix now. Red Orchestra 2 was a lot more, I think, long range combat. And this is still some long range, but also some mix of, of shorter range combat. So we talked uh, previously about the role of fear in, in Red Orchestra, uh, both in Heroes of Stalingrad and in Rising Storm. How do you go about designing an emotion like fear <laughs> in a shooter, and how do you sort of facilitate it or produce it? I think uh, a lot of shooters try to make the player feel like they're a super soldier. You know, they can get shot 15 times, run around, 
and not die. So, so in our shooters, we really try to make the player feel vulnerable. Not so vulnerable that, that, uh, that they can't have fun, but that they know that any moment, you know, one shot, one or two shots might take them out. So, uh, so giving them that vulnerability really makes, you know, when the bullets start whizzing around your head, you don't have this attitude of, well, I'll take three or four shots and I'll just keep moving. You know that any one of those will, will take you out of the action. So, so it actually causes stress and fear in the player. So the real trick with that is balancing it to where it's not so much that it's not enjoyable. And that's finding that sweet spot is very challenging. And I think that's something we've, we've really managed to do well with Rising Storm now. So one of the things we were talking about when I was visiting Tripwire last month was just how you feel about the state of multiplayer shooters. We were talking about Call of Duty, you know, relative to Red Orchestra, but we didn't get a chance to bring up Battlefield. And um, you know, this this is arguably a more direct competitor to Red Orchestra. It's a 64-player game. Um, it's you know larger maps, things like that. So I, I'd love to hear just what, what you thought of Battlefield Three. Um, I. I would, I'd be ashamed to, I, I may be ashamed to admit this, I think I played about 10 minutes of Battlefield 3, so uh, I, uh, I probably am not that qualified to comment on it. Um, I know, you know, just the general buzz of the fans is that they were kind of disappointed that it went in more of a Call of Duty style direction, smaller maps and that type of thing, but, uh, um, you know, that it wasn't quite the spiritual successor or the, the true successor to Battlefield 2 that a lot of people wanted. I think if I had uh, if I had any criticism at all to direct their way, and I won't, I'll be kind of nice because I'm friends with some of the guys that work there, but just their lack of support for the mod community. You know, they've openly come out and said, we can't give out mod, we won't give out mod tools because we don't think that modders are, uh, are smart enough or good enough, I can't remember the exact quote, uh, to use our tools. And I think that that's, that's just a shame because, uh, because one of the things, particularly in the early days that made Battlefield such a success was desert combat. You know, I, I've, I've heard from mostly reliable sources that at one point in time, 50% of the people that were buying Battlefield 1942 were buying it to play desert combat. You know, and not giving out mod tools has limited Battlefield 3 to any of that kind of innovation. You know, you have guys like the Forgotten Hope team, you know, that uh, that have some you know that have made some really cool mods for Battlefield in the past. If they want to make them for Battlefield Three, they have to hack the files and things like that. And it's it's a real shame because you know there might be some really cool shooter that would come out of that, a really cool mod, and and the fans are losing out because of that. So as someone who's been modding for a long time and just generally been involved in development, um, and as someone who one a makes something a real contest. Has modding gotten significantly easier? How has, how has it changed in the past decade or so? I think modding has gotten a lot, lot, lot more challenging. I mean, you used to be able to make a mod with five people or ten people. And you used to be able to make particularly the art and level content really fast. You know, eight years ago when we released uh, the Red Orchestra mod, you know, low poly, lower polygon models, you know, um, you know, much more basic geometry in the levels. It now takes so much time. It takes four or five times as many artists to create one asset than it did, or, or four and five times as much time to create one asset that it did back then. So I think it's, that's gotten really challenging. It's also, for whatever reason, um, I think a lot of PC players don't pay attention to mods anymore. I'm, I'm not sure why that is, but it, I've seen so many really high quality mods come out in the past three or four years you know, frankly, they blew away the stuff that most of us were doing, you know, eight years ago when we were modders. And they just don't get the traction that they used to. What are some of those mods that you want to draw attention to? Oh, um, I mean, back when we were doing R01, you know, the, the Marin Ostrom and Darkest Hour. But, you know, some of the other, some of the other mods, there's, uh, there was a, 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 I think it was a Crytek or Crisis mod that was uh, like a Mech Warrior mod that was really really neat. I'm, I'm sorry that the if the, the yeah, Living Legends I think Living, yeah, yeah, Mech Warrior Living Legends was really great. Um, on the flip side, um, I'm really excited that something like Daisy took off because that's that's uh, really uh, outside of Daisy there hasn't been uh, a mod that was really captured people's imagination probably since Dota you know, that really got the attention of so many players. And it's also, frankly, 
expose a lot of people to the Arma series that wouldn't have played it originally. You know, they're like, oh, this is this military simulator, you know, and I'm not really into that. And they're like, oh, there's a zombie mod. Okay, I'm going to try it. And I think that's great, uh, you know, looping back to my comments about uh, players uh, kind of getting stuck in, in the rut of, of very casual shooters like Call of Duty. Um, it's exposed them to a more tactical shooter. And I think that's good for the shooter genre as a whole, that these players are now experiencing gameplay mechanics that are outside of their comfort zone. And, and hopefully that will, that will uh, carry over into the whole genre. People will be more willing to try other shooters that, that don't just have the casual shooter, kind of the Hollywood shooter uh, mentality. And speaking of zombie games, you guys do produce once, you know, you could say it's in, within that genre, Killing Floor. And I, I'd love to have you speak to uh, how, how surprised you've been. It, it seems like Killing Floor has done really well. I remember it, it sold a million copies, I think, last year. Yeah, um, it's way over that now. Yeah, so... I think we're, uh, I think we're, we're 1.7 million, and I think uh, we're on a trajectory that, I mean, if I had to guess, maybe we'll hit 2 million by the end of the year. It's still selling really great. And we were incredibly surprised by the success. You know, when we, when we started working on it, it was before uh, Left 4 Dead came out. It was before Walking Dead, the, the show came out, and nobody really knew that zombies were going to be the big thing or something like that. So uh, we put the game out, and we thought, if this game sells 50,000 copies, we'll consider it a success. And I think we did that in just a few days. <laughs> and, uh, you know, now, all, you know, 1.7 million copies of, of, of the game later, we're... We still have to pinch ourselves occasionally, you know, that that at just how successful it was. I think one of the big things too that we were we were really excited about with the success is the game was built on an ancient engine at the time. It was Unreal Engine 2, and uh, you know the first Unreal Engine 2 game came out in 2002. You know, and lots of gamers uh, will say you know gameplay is greater than graphics, and uh, we put that to the test. I mean, we essentially risked our company. On, on the saying, gameplay is greater than graphics. And, uh, and fortunately, it turned out to be true. I think, it, I think uh, we realized that also that, you know, you know, awesome graphics are great. You know, I saw the Battlefield 4 trailer the other day and I was like, wow, this, this looks amazing. But, uh, but I was also in the back of my head thinking, what kind of PC am I gonna need to run this? And I think a big part of the reason for Killing Floor's success is because it was based on older tech, anybody could play it. They dusted off their eight-year-old laptop and fired it up and like, I can play Killing Floor on this. And, you know, the, the, the games didn't get in the way of their fun by requiring them to go spend $600 on a new video card or something like that. And, you know, I love, I love games with great graphics. I love to push the envelope in our games. But, you know, sometimes you got to remind game developers the gameplay is more important than what it looks like. So, so you guys have continued to produce updates for Killing Floor, uh, holiday events as well. There's one last Christmas. Yep. Um, are you going to continue to produce that type of content in 2013? Oh yeah, absolutely. We we will. I mean, the uh, the holiday events have been great. The players love it. We've also got uh, we've also got some surprises that we're working on for Killing Floor. I can't I can't say what they are, but uh, there's no, nothing you want to tease. I'll, oh, I'll tease absolutely. There are some cool stuff coming this year, different yep. than the holiday events. Uh, that we're uh, that we're looking at doing for Killing Floor this year, so people will just have to stay tuned to see what those are. All right, we'll look forward to that and Rising Storm, of course, this year, right? Yep. All right. Uh, for more on Rising Storm, visit risingstorm.com, guys. Thanks for your time, John. Thanks for talking to us. All right. Thank you very much, Evan. Thank you.